Yeah. Yeah, because I had changed that when we first started oh, doing let's this. Let's make it a thing now. Do you want to yeah, try one more time? No, but that's because it's going through the default device and not okay. this thing. Okay, you're sure it wasn't like it didn't change? Yeah, because, I mean, we've had it. You're sure you changed it? Okay. Yeah. Let me just plug it in once more just to be sure. <laughs> okay. You'll have to talk into it again. Yeah. Um, that's not it. Yes, I think you'll have to wait for a second. There it is. Let's go. All right, go ahead. All right, do you need to do anything? Yeah, I'm going to just integrate my slides. Hey, Ryan. So, oh, yeah, I, I, my, I just, I'm just opening them separately. I didn't try to integrate them because I was worried. Oh. They're not in the same. No, I, was I don't want to do that the last second. I mean, I can, I can just cut and paste it in, I guess. No, no. I've never done that before. You know what's good on the computer? Yeah, I, I did a, we did a test on this one. Oh. But I just, they're not all in the same PowerPoint file. Okay, normally we ask people to take them in the same PowerPoint file. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I mean, I could have, but I'm not doing this now. Is that going to affect the live stream? Or is it? Well, also, be, I mean, it benefits the audience not to be changing in between them. Yeah. I mean, I could try. Okay. I just never. No, this is my first time ever using PowerPoint, so I'm a little. Scared to do anything that's gonna work. Yeah. Yeah, it's P did you make them on a PC? Yeah, I did. I just I usually don't use I use a different yeah. program. Oh, so yeah. PowerPoint. Yeah. Really not all in the same. Oh. Yeah. Where did, you, where did you save your PowerPoint? Oh, I went into the Okay. I have one too. Then I can I can try that on. So, which is mine? Where is yours? Yes, so let me just try this. This is Acrobat and it's acting up. <laughs> I want to close it all, but it's Elizabeth's stuff, right?
I wish I thought there was something that I could put in. how they got into it, whatever you, you want to talk about about science. Uh, and then our third component is the SI Chance Lab, which is an online uh, publication of sort of current uh, science that you can look at online. You can find out for the survey as well. Um, so those are our programs. We have uh, the lecture series. We aim to make it sort of as participatory as possible. So there will be great questions. Um, don't hesitate to ask questions. And if there are you know, too many to handle uh, during a break, then there will be uh, after the two first chapters of the lecture, there'll be a break. So you can come up and talk to the speakers then before we go on to the third part. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to give you a little run through of how tonight's going to work in case you haven't been here with us before. So we have a team of three graduate student scientists who are either interested in bees or have possibly raised them before or work in a bees uh, sort of lab. And they're going to be giving uh, the talk tonight. Uh, and there will be, like Amy said, there will be frequent pauses for questions um, in which they'll take any questions you have. We are also live streaming the lecture, so uh, just so you're aware, if you ever can't make it here tonight to be here with us, you can also watch the lectures online from our, web from our website, and that streams through YouTube. So you should be able to watch it on your iPad, on your iPhone even. Um, and through the, those settings, you can actually ask questions online. And so you might see Amy or I in the audience uh, seeing if you have any questions from online viewers, and we'll also ask those to our speakers. Um, in addition, if you didn't already pick up one of the handouts, we have these. Uh, they include information about the, the talk tonight, as well as a list of vocabulary um, words from tonight's lecture and future events or resources that you can check out. We also have a survey up here that we love for you guys to fill out, give us feedback on what you like, what you don't like, any future topics you'd love to see in our lecture series. And this really helps us form our next um, series, which we'll have in the spring and next fall as well. And I believe at the end of tonight's lecture, we'll also be having a beekeeper coming in. And they have brought some um, things that they use in keeping their bees, and we'll be able to answer any more questions you have on the topic. So we have to thank our uh, funders as well. So then we kind of have a lecture series. We're funded by the Harvard Coop, the bookstore, um, the Department of Medical Sciences here at Harvard Medical School, and the Graduate Student Council of Harvard. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liz. To start. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. I'm so pleased you all can make it. My name is Elizabeth Petrick. I will be the first speaker of the evening. The other two speakers are the two handsome gentlemen in the front row, um, Ryan and Kevin. And tonight we hope to tell you some amazing things about bees. To begin with, um, I will be discussing honeybees and humans, the relationship between humans and honeybees. Um, I'll begin with a motivation about uh, why we need bees desperately and why people are worried that we will no longer have bees in the near future. 
Um, and then I'll move on to talking about bees, what they're made of, how they work, how the hive functions. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about uh, some beekeeping practices. Um, the next, the next uh, part of the lecture will be about colony collapse disorder, one of the most serious threats that's currently facing the honeybee population in the US and in Europe. Um, Ryan will be giving that part of the lecture. And finally, Kevin will be talking about his work on building robotic bees, um, the bees of the future, which might either be a dream come true or a nightmare, depending on your feelings about bees and robots. Um, so I'd like to begin with this motivational slide about how heavily our agriculture depends on bee pollination for its very existence. This is a selection of just four crops um, that overwhelmingly depends on honeybee pollination. Um, and the numbers in blue give the values that are attributed to honeybee pollination of those crops. Um, so as you can see, honeybee pollination is a huge industry in the United States. Um, it's valued at 15 billion annually. Um, there are 2 million bee colonies that are rented out for pollination every year, which is very impressive when you consider there are only about 2.5 million bee colonies in the whole United States. Also, the largest pollination event um, is the almond pollination that happens in January. And about 50% of the bees in the country are needed to help pollinate the almond crops. So bees from all over the country get shipped to California. Um, it's, a, it's a great big pollination event, and it's a huge industry. Um, so we would be, we'd be in pretty dire straits uh, agriculturally if it weren't for honeybees. Um, and that's why people are worried about this very serious threat to honeybees. Um, called colony collapse disorder. Uh, Ryan will tell you a lot more about this later, but colony collapse disorder is basically a syndrome in which honeybees abandon and disappear from otherwise apparently very healthy hives. So they leave half brood, they leave honey, um, and they just go away and the hive dies because it needs workers to take care of it. Um, this is happening at a rate that the U.S. Department of Agriculture calls unsustainable. So if honeybees, if colonies continue to be lost at the rate that they're being lost at, beekeeping will no longer be a viable enterprise. And again, Ryan will tell you much more about this. So that's why it's very important, that's one of the reasons why it's very important that we study and learn as much as we can about bees. So bees, how do they work? Um, let's start by talking about bee anatomy and what bees are made of. This is a diagram of the insides of a honeybee. I'm going to tell you just a few things about um, what's inside there. First of all, like most insects, bees are made out of three primary body segments, the head, the thorax, which is like a gut cavity, and the abdomen, which contains all the gut, like the stomach. Bees have four wings, not just two, um, and they're able to fly at about 15 miles per hour, which is actually about as fast as you can run, so that's something to keep in mind next time a swarm of bees is chasing you. Um, and they also have this cool feature where they can disengage their flight muscles uh, from their wings and they can vibrate them to keep warm, to create heat. Um, and they use that heat to keep the colony warm in the winter and also as a thermal defense system. It turns out that bees can withstand slightly higher temperatures than many of their predators. So what's happening in this picture is there's a cluster of bees that has surrounded some hornets that were attacking the hive. And because the hornets die at a lower temperature than the bees, the bees can heat up the hornet and kind of cook it alive. <laughs> also scary. Um, and Kevin will be telling you a lot more about bee flight later and some of the challenges, uh, the, the mechanical challenges involved in making something that can do what bees can do with their wings. Um, bees also famously have stingers. The stingers have barbs, so they get stuck in your skin, um, and there's also a poison sac attached to that barb, so it's very important if you get stung to scrape the stinger off immediately. They have a compound eye, just like a fly. Um, you can see here maybe a little bit, they have many facets. Um, it's good for detecting movement. They have wax glands on their abdomen for creating beeswax. Um, and they have this, this neat little storage basket in their gut called the honey crop. Um, when a bee, when a forager bee goes out and collects nectar, it doesn't immediately go into its digestive system. Instead, it goes into this little storage stomach um, so it can bring it back to the hive to make honey for all the other bees. In addition, bees have um, another kind of storage basket 
called a pollen basket on, its, on their legs. Um, bees don't just eat honey, they also eat pollen. Mostly baby bees eat pollen. And so the bees, when they go out to the flowers, they collect some of the pollen on their on the hairs on the um, on their hairs, and they comb it off themselves and gather it into a ball and stick it into their pollen basket. You can maybe see the little ball of pollen on this bee's pollen basket here. They also have tiny little brains, sesame seed-sized brains. Um, they can do some pretty impressive things, considering that they are just the size of a sesame seed. Bees have been shown to be able to count to four, um, which is Cool, because bees only live for a couple of weeks, and I didn't learn to count to four until I was at least a few years old, and I'm pretty sure my brain is at least the size of a couple of sesame seeds. Um, they can also learn, so it's been shown that bees, uh, if, you, if you train them um, to associate particular colors with food sources, they will prefer going to that color, say blue. If you feed them consistently out of a blue container, they'll look for blue things. So they can learn, not all their behavior is just innate. <coughs> They also have very powerful navigation tools. Um, they, they've been shown to be able to find the shortest route between uh, many different food sources, uh, which is actually a very complicated problem in mathematics called the traveling salesman problem. OK, so the bodies of bees are obviously amazing. But what's also amazing is that the whole bee colony altogether acts as one giant body. Um, no, bees, no single bee can survive just on its own. They're not self-sufficient. So in some sense, the whole hive, the whole colony, behaves as an organism. <coughs> um, so here's the cast of characters in the beehive. First of all, there's the queen, um, who is the generally the, the single fertile mated female in the hive. <coughs> and her job is to lay many, many eggs to create workers that can take care of the hive. She can lay up to 2,000 eggs per day uh, during the most busy seasons of the year. And she also regulates worker behavior by distributing her, her pheromones, her scent, throughout the hive. Um, she comes from, the queens are made by, um, they're, they're, they come from the same eggs as the worker bees do, actually. Um, they're fertilized female eggs, but they're reared with special food called royal jelly. And they're reared in these big queen cells filled with royal jelly, and that makes them turn into queens rather than just remaining workers. It's kind of neat that just feeding them a different food turns them into a different kind of creature. <laughs> um, the second, the second main character here is the drone. Oh, by the way, this is a picture of the queen. She's a little bigger than the other bees. And this is the drone. He is the fertile male. There are a few drones in every hive, and his one job in life is to fertilize a queen bee. Um, so that's why he has this sort of funny body build. Um, he's actually kind of cute looking, I think. He has a stubby little abdomen that's full of his reproductive organs, and he also has these, has these giant, adorable bug eyes compared to the worker bee's small, narrow eyes, so that when he flies out of the hive, he can really see if there's a queen on her mating flight anywhere around. Um, he comes from an unfertilized egg laid by either a queen or occasionally by a fertile worker. <coughs> and the worker bees are the rest of the hive. Almost all of the bees in the hive are workers. There are um, up to several thousand of them. Um, and they are typically infertile females. Uh, there are many different castes of workers. They're all genetically the same, but they have they have different roles in the hive. Some of them act as nurses. Some of them are honey processors. Some of them are guards, foragers, etc. All the other non-reproductive functions in the hive are carried out by workers. And they, like the queen, are fertilized female eggs, but they're not fed sufficient royal jelly to turn them into queens. Okay, so we talked a little bit about. Uh, the beehive. How are baby bees actually made? Um, it's not quite as cute as it sounds, baby bees. First of all, because baby bees are sort of gross to me. Um, but also because there's a lot of violence and family feuds in, in the process of making baby bees. Um, first of all, there's the mating flight. The queen, the virgin queen, um, she mates once in her life. Over the course of a couple of days, she, she flies out and mates with drones until she stores enough sperm to last the rest of her lifetime, two to eight years. For drones, um, mating is their entire purpose in life, and if they do it successfully, they die. Um, so they, they live fast and dramatically, and they're very, very exciting creatures. Um, there's also this idea about the selfish gene. So you might wonder, isn't the queen having it all her way? Why do the workers just do her bidding? Why don't they revolt? 
Um, you know, she's, she's the only one who gets to lay eggs. Why don't the workers have all the, the ability to lay eggs? This can't be good for them genetically, right? <clears throat> um, and the answer turns out to be that, in fact, the genes are having it all their way. It's not the queen who's having it her way. Um, in fact, the genes are in charge of making the hive the way it is. Um, and this is a complicated concept. There could actually probably be a whole seminar just on the idea of the selfish gene. So I'm just going to tell you about it and not really explain it. So don't, don't worry if you don't get it the first time. I'm just going to be describing things. Um, so what happens is that sister worker bees, the, the little worker bees that the queen lays, are actually more closely related to each other than their mother, than their mother is related to them. And so um, because genes, the, the genetic material in the bee, is the kind of thing that wants to replicate itself, it's actually good for the sister bees to try to get their mother to lay more sister bees because they're, they're genes that share more genetic material. <clears throat> so promoting queen fertility actually promotes the sister bees genes, promotes the worker bees genes. Um, so in fact, they're, they're not being enslaved by the queen. They are kind of controlling the queen to make more of their sisters. Um, there's also this phenomenon called worker policing where queens and fertile workers will, will compete to determine the fathers of the next generation. Um, I mentioned earlier that sometimes fertile workers can lay drones. Uh, they, they can never lay other worker bees, but they can lay male bees sometimes. Um, and that's generally not good for the other workers, and so they'll, they'll fight those worker bees who try to lay eggs and um, destroy their eggs sometimes to promote genetic uniformity in the hive. <laughs> Um, and there's, there's been some interesting research on this recently. Uh, there was a candidate for this the so-called selfish gene that causes all this behavior that was discovered just recently in 2008, I believe. Um, if you're interested in reading more about this, uh, I encourage you to check out Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene. Um, he's always entertaining. <laughs> I don't always blog his books. Sometimes I think <laughs> the man himself might need a blogging, but um, it is a very interesting book, and I encourage you to read it if you're interested in these ideas. Um, so, so it's not the end on a kind of sour depressing note about the violence within the beehive. Here are some ways where bees um, communicate and collaborate together. Um, so how do bees communicate? They actually communicate through a variety of methods. They, uh, they buzz at each other, they have visual signals, um, they have chemical signaling, uh, and they also touch each other with their antennae. <clears throat> but one of the most famous ways and interesting ways in which bees communicate is called the waggle dance. Um, forager bees, when they go out and they find a food source, they will come back to the hive and they'll perform a dance that tells the other bees where the food source is and how good it is, how to get to it. <clears throat> um, so here's how the waggle dance works. This scene in the middle is performing what's called a waggle dance. And uh, she, so she, she moves in this figure eight pattern on the honeycomb while the other bees watch what she's doing. As she goes along the middle line of the figure eight, she waggles her abdomen. So you might be able to see that her abdomen looks a little bit blurred in this picture it's because she's wiggling it back and forth really fast. Um, and they, so they, they can use this waggle dance to communicate both the distance and the direction of the food source as well as its quality. Um, here's how that works. The, this, the direction of the food source is indicated by the angle of the waggle dance, of the waggling part of the dance, relative to the vertical in the hive. So if the bee is going off at a 45 degree angle um, relative to up, that means that the, the food source is at a 45 degree angle relative to the sun outside the hive. So worker bees go outside the hive and they can just go in the direction indicated by the dancing bee. Also the distance to the food source is indicated by the length of the waggling part of the dance. So farther away food sources will, will take longer waggles. The quality of the food source is usually indicated by how long the bee dances and how excited she is while she's dancing. It's true. Um, these also have an interesting way of stopping each other if they think that the dance that's being performed is not good. Um, I guess it's, you know, it's kind of like some TV shows we have. So bees will, bees will actually headbutt each other if they think that the dancing bee um, is, is performing a dance that will lead the bees into a dangerous area or will lead the bees into a place where there's a lot of competition. Um, the, the bees that are around the dancing bee that know about this food source and know it's dangerous will go up to the bee and start headbutting her 
until she stops dancing. Kind of interesting. OK, so here's something that you might want to know about bees, probably the most interesting thing to humans. How do bees make honey? So as I said before, forager bees go out, they find nectar, and then they drink the nectar, but they don't digest it. They just store it in their honey crop. Next, they bring it back to the hive, and that's, that's where their job ends. They then regurgitate it into the crop of a processor bee, a different cast of bee that is stationed near the front of the hive. The processor bee then puts the nectar into a honeycomb cell with a sugar-digesting enzyme called invertase. And the honey then cures for a while while the bees evaporate the water from it by fanning it with their wings. And this whole process takes about five days until the honey is ripe. And then finally, when the honey is ready, the bees seal it off with a little cap of wax. By the way, does anybody know why honeycomb is hexagonal, why it has six sides? Yeah, very good. Yeah. It turns out that a hexagon is the shape that can interlock, that can make this interlocking shape that requires the least amount of wax to make. Um, and wax is very expensive for the bees to make. It takes um, uh, six pounds of honey to make one pound of wax, basically. Here are some other interesting facts about honey. Honey has less than 18.6% water content, um, which is too little for bacteria to grow. So you might have heard honey doesn't spoil. That's actually true. Um, bacteria can't grow in it, as long as you keep it well sealed and water moisture doesn't get into it. Um, a forager bee can carry up to her own weight in nectar, about 100 milligrams. And to make a jar's worth of honey, bees, a beehive, collectively flies the equivalent of about once around the earth. So a jar's worth is about a pound. That's all the work that those bees are doing for you. Um, so that's the, that ends the first part of my talk. There will be time for questions now. Just to wrap up, we talked about bee anatomy, colony organization, reproduction, communication in the hive, and honey making. And I'll be happy to take your questions on anything I've talked about so far. Yes, sir? Hi. My name is Melania. And do bees have like family? Do bees have family? Yeah, like they know this is my sister and this is not my sister. Like ah, yes. Yes, they do, yes. And they will defend their hive against um, intruders. So bee theft is actually a, a problem. Honeybees will try to go into each other's hives and take the honeybees. It's, it's hard to make honey. It's like, you know, it's like being a thief, right? It's easier to steal somebody else's hard work than to do your own hard work. And so stranger bees will try to come into the hive and take honey, and the other bees won't recognize them, so they'll chase them off or try to kill them. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am? Uh, yes, the bees made it. Yeah. Yes, sir? If I uh, give a adult worker bee royal jelly, does it turn into a queen or is that something that only happens at the larval stage? I believe it only happens at the larval stage. That's an interesting question though. I don't know. Yes, sir? Yes, you would. What's going to happen if I just like swatted the queen bee and killed it? <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> 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 saying that I didn't know, you know, this is how devastating. No, that's a good question. Yes. The, the question was, what would happen if you killed the queen bee? Um, well, because the queen bee comes from the same egg as the worker bees, the workers would stop smelling the queen bee's pheromone in the hive, and they would know that something bad happened to her, and they would start turning one of the eggs that she recently laid into a queen bee by feeding her over time. Yes, ma'am? I've heard that bees don't have that many predators, but there is a certain type of frog that will sit outside of the hive and basically just pick off bees as they come in, killing them. Oh, wow. They will destroy the hive. That's why I'd say we have hives, make sure that they're far enough off the ground that there's no way that this frog can rest. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. No, I haven't heard of that. But I do know that you're supposed to keep hives off the ground because of, of potential predators. Um, yeah, any kind of creature will. Try to make the honey if it can. Um, wow, with so many hands. Yes, sir? Uh, could you discuss the use of the smoker? Yes, I would be happy to. That's actually in the next part of my talk. Uh, okay. um, please ask me again if, if you still have questions. The question was about the use of a smoker. Uh, yes, ma'am? Yes, you will. Um, is it true that bees die after they sting you? Yes, that is true. Bees do die after they sting you. Um, 
they have this barbed stinger, and so the barb gets caught in your skin, and it pulls out um, some of their internal organs that are after them, and they can't survive that. <laughs> Um, you said that the community lives up to eight years, I think you said? Yes. Um, do the different um, roles that a bee plays uh, have something to do with their lifespan? Do they have different lifespans? Uh, yes. Um, worker, bees, worker bees typically live a couple of weeks in the summer months when they're, they're foraging really hard they can wear themselves out fast. During the winter months, the bee's job is basically just to keep the hive warm, keep the queen fed until it's time to go out for the summer again, so those bees tend to live a couple months or more longer. So yes, it does depend on their role. The, the queen lives several years, the workers only weeks two months. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I think we have to move on. Um, so I'll move on to the second part of my talk, but uh, if you have any further questions, you can talk to me during the break or ask them later. Um, so the next part of my talk will be about beekeeping. Um, I guess I should confess that I'm not actually a biologist at all. I've just been thinking it this whole time. Um, I'm really a physicist, and I'm interested in bees because I used to feed them when I, when I grew up in Indiana, um, in farm country in Indiana. I didn't keep them very well, but um, I became very interested in them. Um, so now that I've graduated, my family is keeping bees again, and they're doing much better than they used to when I was around for some reason. Um, so this is a picture of my dad. Uh, starting a beehive. Um, so I'm going to tell you now about how to start a bee apiary, which is a bee yard, a um, place where you keep beehives, and how to keep bees. So step one is to set up a beehive. This is a beehive here. Um, it's white. Bees tend to like white for some reason. Um, and it's elevated off the ground, uh, like the gentlewoman said. <laughs> um, and inside you can see a bunch of frames. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of them later, but they're they have a template for honeycomb that the bees can build on. Um, my dad is wearing this protective beekeeping garb, including boots, long gloves that go up to the elbows, a white uh, coverall outfit. Um, again, bees like white, it tends to make them less aggressive for some reason. Um, and a bee veil to cover his face and also to cover his hair. Bees really hate hair. It makes them think that there's a bear or something trying to raid their hive. Um, uh, so this is a smoker. Um, we'll be talking about the, well, actually, no, I'll talk about the use of the smoker now. Um, bees, so when you want to open the beehive, you want to try to get the bees to be as calm as possible because you don't want them to um, hurt themselves or hurt you. Um, so the way that that is often done is you have this thing called the smoker, which is a can that has a little bellows attached to it, and inside you put some fuel, and you light it on fire and um, puff it, and smoke comes out. And so you puff it into the hive, and smoke goes into the hive. And the bees think that their hive is on fire. And for some reason, that actually calms them down, because they eat a lot of honey, because um, they think they're going to have to flee the hive. But then, like people, they get really tired after they eat a lot, so they're kind of all sluggish. And <laughs> so it's very, it's very interesting reaction they have. Um, you also will need a hive tool if you want to keep bees. Um, so as you can see, you can kind of take the, the hive apart so you can go into it and look at what's going on and take the honey out. Um, but bees obviously think that the fact that you can open up their hive is a huge structural defect, and so they try to fix that relentlessly. So they'll, they'll try to stick the whole hive together with this stuff called propolis, which is also called bee glue. Um, they go out into the woods and they collect things like pine sap, uh, sometimes even like industrial adhesives, and they, they stick their whole hive together. So you have to pry it open every time with this hive tool. Um, and also to get them started, and during the lean months, you can feed them some syrup, some you know, corn syrup or just simple syrup. Uh, finally, um, my parents planted here a bee home remedy garden. Uh, it turns out that plants with essential oils, um, there's some lore that, that says that plants that have oils like, like thyme and spearmint and things like that are good for the bees and help them ward off predators. So my parents have planted a, uh, not predators rather, parasites. Um, so my bees have planted and my bees, my parents have planted the garden, <laughs> not the bees, um, um, with, those, with those herbs to help protect the bees from mites and other predators that Ryan will talk about later. Uh, the next step is to buy some bees. You can actually get them in the mail. 
Um, so you mail order your bees, and they come into the post office, and the postal workers are usually kind of freaked out about these buzzing boxes. We can go pick it up. Um, and so my dad's there smoking the bees, calming them down. Um, my dog is not sure about the whole process. <laughs> Um, and these bees come from bee breeders. They're actually professional bee breeders. And what they do is um, basically exactly what the gentleman in the back <laughs> mentioned. Um, they don't squish the queen, but they take a queen out of a healthy hive. And that makes the, the worker bees in that hive try to produce a bunch of queens. And so here there are a bunch of queen cells that these worker bees are taking care of and, and breeding. Um, so bees are bred for productivity, docility, disease resistance, etc. There are many different kinds of bees you can buy. <laughs> and the third step is to pour the bees into their new home. Um, so here's my dad pouring the bees into their home. The queen is initially in a separate little cell. She's the most important one because she's the one who's going to populate the hive. And so to get the other bees used to her scent, she's kept in a, a special little box that has a piece of hard candy in the bottom of it. So the bees have to slowly eat through the candy and that gives, that gives her time to spread her scent through the hive so that they're used to her. And now we're going to be keepers. Um, so now that you're a beekeeper, what should you be doing? Um, you have a few responsibilities as a beekeeper. The most obvious one is probably to nurture the bees. Um, you, need, you need to provide them with shelter, uh, keep up the hive, make sure it's not uh, kind of falling apart and there aren't, there aren't dead animals and stuff in it who tried to get to the honey. Um, control pests and diseases by giving your bees medicine when they need it and um, provisioning them, giving them sugar and syrup during lean times. It's also important that the beekeeper act as a liaison with other humans. Um, so you need to make, make sure the neighbors understand that you have bees and they're not afraid of them. Take care of the swarms when your bees swarm. Um, and also encourage the farmers in the area to use caution when they're applying pesticides to their crops so that they don't kill your bees. Um, one of the most interesting jobs of the beekeeper is to regulate colony life. Um, the queen lives, as I said, for eight years at most, but she usually stops being as productive after a couple of years. So at that point, it's the beekeeper's job to put in a new queen into the hive um, so that the bees can continue being productive and also control swarming. Finally, um, the beekeeper's job is to use the bees for, for human purposes. Harvest the honey and the beeswax and use the bees for pollination. So here's a fun game. This is something that a beekeeper spends a lot of time doing. Um, it's important to make sure that your hive has a queen and that she's laying and she's healthy. So let's see how good of beekeepers you are. Can you spot the queen in this picture? Someone sees it. Wow, you guys are quick. Just call it out. Where is, where is she? At the bottom? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, she has a darker thorax and a larger abdomen than the other bees. Here is the queen. Very good. Okay, and then finally, if you're a good beekeeper, you get to reap the rewards. Um, so again, this is my dad um, getting to uncap the cells from the, the, the honey part of the hive. <coughs> and my dad and my grandma extracting the honey by putting the frames into a centrifuge and spinning them so that the honey comes out. And in the end, you get some, some honey to come out. Um, yes. I think my parents are watching this on live stream, so if somebody could ask a question about, like, why my dad looks so much like James Bond, I'll slip you the vibe later. <laughs> um, so that about wraps up my part of the talk. Uh, I've, I've discussed starting an apiary, breeding honeybees, beekeeper responsibilities, and harvesting honey. Are there any questions? Wow. I guess I... You said a couple times uh, controlling the swarming. Um, control swarming. Right. Um, so bees will swarm for a number of reasons. Um, they'll, they'll swarm if they think that their queen is getting too old and she's not productive anymore. They'll, they'll uh, make a new queen and then many of the bees will leave the hive with her. Um, so one of your jobs is to make sure that the queen stays productive so that that, that doesn't happen. Um, they'll also swarm if they just if they don't like their home, they want a new one, so you have to keep up the hive and make sure that they're well fed where they are. Yes, ma'am? I grew up next to a beekeeper and I experienced swarming as a child. I was actually outside playing, sitting there, and there were five of us. I had the bees above me, and they're flying around and they're dropping honey and everything. And the next day we found them in a tree. It was massive. I can't even tell you, thousands of bees. But it's kind of cool and kind of scary. 
The students, we won't do your research in the lab. What kind of bees do you want to use? Oh, um, as I said, I'm not actually a biologist. I don't study bees. Uh, so there will be a beekeeper here later. You should feel free to ask her. Yeah, okay. so the next question is that the bees are supposed to the honey that you buy in the store, the honey, it's supposed to be good for the health of glands or something. Oh, I don't know if you know that much. Of it. Yeah, I don't know that much. One more question. Yeah. Where can I buy some honey or <laughs> sugar? We are. <laughs> sugar. No sugar. They have nothing to give with honey without sugar. Do they automatically have sugar? Yeah, yeah. That's why they need like it. They have a sweet tooth for us. Because I still love a fruit that's taken from my cereal, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, my time's up. I'm afraid. I'm just going to talk to you guys later. Thank you. 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 Thank you
wow, we went from six million to like three million bees. Um, wow, all the bees are dying. Well, it turns out this part of the graph here is just people stopped keeping bees so much. So this is actually not as dramatic and scary as it looks. Uh, it wasn't until around the 90s that bees actually started dying from diseases and things like that. Um, this is just basically lack of interest here. Um, but since 2005, what has happened? Well, it turns out since 2005, when we first had colony flaps to sort of appear, we've had about a 30% loss of bee colony every year. Um, and so you're probably wondering now, well, so we were here, how many bees do we have now? Well, it turns out that since the beginning of colony collapse disorder right here, we've actually had a stable bee population. Um, we haven't, if anything, we've actually gained some bees. And so we're thinking maybe what's going on? And we're, we're losing 30% a year, but the population is staying the same. Well, what's happening is, as Elizabeth mentioned, you just make new bees. You take make new queens, you give them to a new colony, you just make new bees. So basically what's happening is that we are losing a lot of bees, but we're replacing them basically just as fast as we're losing them. And the end result is that it's just costing people uh, more money to, to, to make bees and to have bees. But I did want to um, sort of highlight this. And so what we have here, this situation of having two pieces of information which sort of tell different stories. So if you only had this, this one on the right, you would think, oh, we're losing the bees. This is really terrible. All the bees are disappearing. And if you only had this, this graph on the left, you'd think, oh, well, the bees are fine. We have the same amount of bees. They're not dying. Um, and so what we as scientists do is we try, to fig we try to, A, find both of these pieces of information so we get the whole story, and we try to synthesize it and reconcile this. And so there is an answer. The answer is, oh, well, we're making more bees. But um, I want you to kind of keep this in mind, this idea of, Sometimes a picture looks very clear, but if you have extra information uh, later, it can kind of conflict with that, and you have to synthesize what, and figure out what's really going on. Um, and so that what I'm going to do now, um, oh, and the one final thing I wanted to mention is that actually the worldwide honeybee um, population is increasing uh, quite a bit. It's about 45% more than it was um, a few years ago. So it's, they're not all dying. Um, we're just losing uh, quite a few here. The, but what I want to do now is to talk a little bit about um, recent research that's gone on and trying to figure out what the cause was. And so when I started this project, um, I didn't really know much about colony collapse disorder. But I remember thinking, oh, well, I, I saw a headline somewhere. They figured out what that is. They, 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 know, they know about that. And so what I'm going to do now is sort of take some of the, the biggest stories where people said, oh, we found it. And it sort of was in the headlines, since this is science in the news. And so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the science that was, was in the news. Um, and so first I want to start off with how do, these, how do we generally evaluate these cases? So what happens is you take a col the colonies that are dying from this syndrome, and you take colonies that are not, and you basically compare them. That's the simplest way to do it. And then you figure out, is there something that's happening to the colonies that are dying that's not happening to the other colonies? It's fairly straightforward. Um, and then the next two things you want to do, and maybe not necessarily in this order, is you want to have rep be able to replicate the results, have somebody else find the same thing, and then if you can, um, have a, a controlled experiment. So for example, if you think it's a virus, you take your bees in a lab and you inject them with the virus and you see, uh, do, they, do they then die? Um, so that's sort of the, how the, these, the study of this works. Um, but we want to keep in mind that with anything you do, there are a lot of limitations. And so in these studies, and in general, with like these kinds of studies, there's a series of limitations. The first is the study size. So by definition, we can't sample every bee out there. There's a lot of bees that are sick or dying. We can't look at all of them. So we have to take a small population. And so it's possible that when you study a population, you're only getting a small picture. You can never get the whole picture, which is why um, having somebody replicate your results is so important because then you get a, you can get a better idea of the entire population. Um, the second thing is making sure you define this correctly. So if you're not looking at a colony that actually died from colony collapse disorder, you're going to find things that are, are not correct. So you have to be sure that you've actually defined it correctly and you're actually looking at colonies that died from this, this syndrome. Um, and then the third thing is, uh, this is sort of inherent in all of these studies, um, and we can't really get around it, but are you collecting the right bees? So once a colony has collapsed, you have the bees that are left behind, um, they're basically young bees or, or, or the queen, they didn't die. So they, it's possible that they don't actually have 
whatever it was that killed the, the bees that are gone. Um, and that's something you can't really get around, but uh, it's, it's a concern. And then the final thing is what you do in the lab versus in the field. So as I mentioned before, if you were to take, um, if you want to find out if a virus is causing this, and you take it in the lab in your controlled environment, and you inject it to the bees, is that the same way that the bees are exposed to it in the wild? Is that going to produce the same effects? Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and so basically there's three potential causes that have been very well investigated. Um, the first is uh, infectious disease, uh, also parasites that affect bees, and finally pesticides. I'm going to talk about each of those in turn, uh, starting with infectious disease. Um, so viruses, there's a number of viruses that commonly infect bees. And there's about 20 of them, and in general most of them are sort of like getting a cold. They don't kill the bees, but they're, they're not great for the bees. Um, and so one of the first studies, what they did when they were looking for what was causing this is they took a bunch of colonies that had colony collapse disorder and took a bunch of colonies that didn't. And basically what they did was they kind of round them up and they pulled out the genetic uh, material, the DNA and the RNA and stuff like that from, from the colonies. And as you probably know, every species, everything has a unique uh, DNA genetic code. And so what they did is they took all of this DNA and they looked at it to find out what was in there. So they could see everything. They could see the bee DNA, they could see any kind of bacteria, virus, whatever that's in there. And so they compared what's going on in the ones that have colony collapse disorder versus the ones that don't have it. And they found something really interesting, which is this Israel acute bee paralysis virus. And they found, you can see here, they found it in almost all of the colonies that were collapsing, but almost none of the colonies that didn't. So they, right away it looks very good. Um, and in addition to that, it's a very new virus. It had only been discovered a few years earlier, and it had just been found in the U.S. like the year before. So the, the timeline matches up really well. It basically appears at about the same time that this disorder appears. And then finally, uh, after this report, people were able to take the virus, and inject it into bees. You can see these bees on the bottom here received the virus, the bees on the top didn't, and they, they, these bees actually died. Um, and so this looks really convincing. And I remember at the time this came out, I was pretty convinced. Um, but it, we did some follow-up work, and it turns out that um, this is probably not what, maybe this does kill bees, but it's probably not the cause of colony collapse disorder. Um, further testing showed that this is actually a fairly rare disease uh, in the wild. It turns out it's very, it's more common in the Northeast, which is where these colonies came from. But when they expanded it to include the Midwest and all other parts of the U.S., they found that that's actually a fairly rare virus. Um, and then the second part is that in the field, it's not clear that it's actually that lethal um, because someone actually did a, a longitudinal study where they sampled the bee uh, colony over a period of time, and they found that these kinds of viruses tend to come and go. And it turns out that maybe this is not actually killing the bees, but it's still it's still not clear with this. But what is clear is that it's definitely not the cause of a colony collapse disorder. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, microsporidia. Which is fungus called Nosema, Nosema ser serenae. Um, and this is uh, also a relatively new um, infection of bees. It was just found in, a, in around 2007 in the US. So again, it coincides with the time that this, this disorder started being seen. But it basically, when people look for it, it's basically everywhere. So it's in all the colonies that die, but it's almost in all the colonies that don't die too. So the previous study I, I mentioned, they actually found this, uh, this fungus in there, but they found it was in basically everything. So they thought, well, this is probably not the cause, and that's generally what people think. But there was a, a follow-up study where people looked, they did a similar sort of experiment where they matched up the bees and they looked at them, and, and instead of looking at the DNA, this time they looked at the protein. And what they found was they found this high association between um, colony collapse disorder and being infected with Nosema, this fungus, and in addition, uh, a virus called iridovirus. And they published a paper about it, and there was a, a New York Times headline that said, scientists and soldiers solve a bee mystery. Um, and then here you can see they actually infected it. These little orange uh, squares are bees that have been infected with both these things, and the green ones are bees that weren't infected with these. And you see that basically all the bees die if they're infected with both of these. So again, it looks pretty convincing. But actually, when this, as soon as this came out, it was a little bit controversial because nobody had ever seen this iridovirus in bees before. So I mentioned the earlier study, they, they didn't see this virus at all, and nobody had ever seen this virus in bees before. And so it was a little bit strange. Um, and basically, the follow-up study has found, again, that this 
uh, um, viruses not present in bees, and they couldn't figure out what happened until they somebody did a reanalysis of, of the information. And so when I, I mentioned before, they looked at the compared to protein, and the way that this program works is it basically takes, it's kind of like having a picture of a protein. And what they did was they compared it to a database of diseases that could affect bees. And so it's like having a, a picture of a protein that is in the bees and a picture of all these disease proteins. And, and basically the program says, well, I'm going to pick whatever one matches best. And what they didn't do is they left out bee, bee proteins. So basically the program found that, well, here's a, a match. This is the best match I could find, and it was iridovirus. But if you actually included, if you gave the program pictures of B proteins, it said, oh, it's a B protein. That's totally what it is. And it turns out the match was very poor uh, for the iridovirus. And so the, the entire thing was actually sort of an artifact of accidentally using the wrong, um, the wrong setup when they're, when they're identifying this. So uh, the quest moved on. Um, this is another parasite that affects bees. It's called Varroa destructor. It's a mite, which is basically like a tick. It uh, grabs onto the bee and uh, sucks out its blood. And this one, um, we already know, is not the cause of colony collapse disorder. And we can tell this because you can see, you can actually see them on the bees. So there's plenty of colonies that collapse, and they clearly have no evidence that this is um, that this is there. But I wanted to mention it because this is actually the most important par uh, killer of honey bees. This kills more bees than than colony collapse by far, and has killed many, many more bees over the course of the time it's been here. Um, so I really wanted to, to mention it just because it's a very dangerous threat for honeybees. On top of that, it's able to vector uh, viruses to bees. So there's certain viruses that the bees are okay if they get them. But if the, this mite is, has the virus inside it and then bites the bee, it actually turns into a very deadly virus. So it can kill, uh, it can cause um, honeybee death in a number of ways. And there is sort of, as I said, it didn't cause colony collapse disorder, but there is an association. So if you have this virus, this uh, this bro destructor, you're a little bit more likely to die of colony collapse disorder. So it might be contributing in some way. So the, the, the last single cause I want to talk about is uh, pesticides. And so first, uh, what do we use pesticides for? Well, we use them for killing insects. So of course, bees being insects, they're a target of pesticides. So it makes sense that uh, pesticides that kill bees. And so one of the ones that people are interested in a lot is these, this class of pesticides called neonicotinoids. And so this is a picture here of a, a neonicotinoid. It's just a, a molecular structure. It looks a lot like nicotine. Um, and the way that these things work, they're uh, systemic pesticides. And the way that works is that instead of spraying your crops with a pesticide, you put it on the seeds themselves, the corn seeds in this example. And then they grow. And as they grow, the pesticide spreads out through the plant. And when an insect eats that plant, it dies because it's been exposed to the pesticide. And so there's been a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work on pesticides and bees. And I'm just going to talk about one study in particular, which was very, um, sort of very, uh, very much in the news about a year ago. Um, and it's a pretty good summary of, of what goes on. Um, and so this one, this, the, the guy who did this study had an idea. He said, well, Beekeepers feed their bees um, high fructose corn syrup as like a, a alternate food supply instead of eating their honey. So you harvest their honey, you give them some food, you give them high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup, of course, comes from corn. So he said, well, maybe there's a pesticide that's in there, and when you make the high fructose corn syrup, um, it's turning into something toxic. It's concentrating the pesticide, and the bee eats the high fructose corn syrup and then dies because it had the pesticide in it. So what he did was he took high fructose corn syrup and he spiked it with pesticide. And he gave it to bees and he had bees that didn't get it. He had bees that got you know, varying concentrations of, of high fructose corn syrup or pesticide. And it turns out that all the bees that got the pesticide died. And almost all the bees that didn't get it were, were alive. So um, the, basically it's a, this, is, this is the cause. And he published a paper called In Situ Replication of Honeybee Colony Collapse Disorder. So he claimed, this is it, I found it, I've actually recreated it. Not only did I, I, I find it, I recreated it in the field. And there was actually a, a lot of news about this. One headline that was in a, a Reuters editorial about it. Um, so it, is this the cause? Well, there were a few issues with this study, um, and the people pointed out right away. Uh, so the first is his hypothesis that pesticide is in corn syrup. 
So it's a really interesting idea, except for the fact that there's no pesticide found in corn syrup. No one's ever actually found pesticide in corn syrup, at least at any levels that can be detected. Um, so the, the idea of where it, how this actually happened is not clear. And what he said was that, well, maybe at the time in 2006, some got in. And I don't have any 2006 corn syrup, so I can't tell for sure. But maybe if we could test that, it would be there. But then the, the, the question is, well, if it was there in 2006, why are they still dying and there's no, corn, there's no pesticide in corn syrup now? So that's a little, that's a little bit confusing. That's really the, the biggest problem is that it's not clear that this would be happening at all. There's no evidence that there's pesticide in corn syrup. Uh, the, the second big problem was that the doses he used were really, really high. So we, can, we know exactly what the doses of pesticide are that the bees are exposed to. So if you take corn, you can find out how much pesticide. This is very, very little. Um, and the doses he gave them in here were from anywhere from 10 to 100 fold higher than anything that the bees would see in the wild. So it seems like it's, it's not surprising that they died because it was such a high dose of a pesticide which kills insects. Uh, the third thing was that he tested only a few colonies. So there were four for each, each treatment condition. And as I mentioned before, we had the issue where they thought they found it, but they didn't have enough colonies because they, they didn't have enough sample size. And in this case, there's definitely an issue of, well, did they die of something else? It's really hard to make a, a generalization in such a small uh, sample size. And then the final thing in his study that people criticized was that, so he said, I replicated colony collapse disorder. But he also said the bees uh, died around the hives. So there were dead bees all around the hives, which is actually not it's specifically not a feature of colony collapse disorder. So there's a question of whether or not he was even seeing colony collapse disorder. Um, and then there's a lot of other uh, sort of contrary associated evidence, um, one being that people have looked before to see if there's an association between feeding these high fructose corn syrup and colony collapse, and they have not found it. Um, another one is people have looked at, at colonies. You can actually take the colony and find out what pesticides are in it. And there doesn't seem to be any association, basically, colonies that have colony collapse disorder and those that don't have it have equal levels of pesticides in them for the most part. Um, and the final thing is that the, the epidemiological evidence for, for pesticide involvement is, is, is still fairly weak in that pesticides are, these pesticides, at least the neonicotinoids, are used everywhere in the world. And colony collapse disorder is not occurring everywhere in the world. For example, in Australia, there's never been a case of colony collapse disorder. But there's a lot of pesticide use. They use these just as much. And similarly, if you compare like where colony collapse disorder happens, like geographically across the U.S. versus use of pesticides, it just doesn't line up very well. Um, which is not to say that pesticides don't hurt bees, because they, they do hurt bees. And in the high amounts, they kill bees. And definitely, they could be having an effect. But what we know from the evidence is that it's clear that they don't by themselves just flat out kill the bees. Um, they could be doing other things, which is, there's a lot of in investigation into that. But as far as we know, these neonicotinoids, which again, there's been a lot of talk about, I just want to be clear, uh, as far as we know, they're not actually outright killing bees, except in, in limited cases we're talking to. So with that, I'll take a brief break for questions. Yes? So you said that only one of the three the workers are just leaving. Everything else is still at home. Yeah. So has anyone, no one has come across like a large just pile of dead workers somewhere? No, and that's, you know, that's, that, that, that's the thing that I was thinking when I started this. I was like, oh, well, I'll figure out, you know, they, they know that the workers go off somewhere or something. They just disappear. They literally disappear. And I guess, like, the, the reasoning is, is that, well, they must have gone somewhere and died. You know, they're little. We, you wouldn't see it. You know, I, I've actually seen a dead bee here and there, you know, on the sidewalk or whatever. Um, so I think it's just basically thought, and, and they can't live without the colony. So at some point they're dead. <laughs> and the queen is still there, so it's almost like they're thinking the queen isn't there anymore. I mean, I'm wondering if it's something to do with their sense of smell. Oh, could, yeah, it definitely could be behavioral. So as, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's, what, I'm sorry? Oh, sorry, sorry, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, you asked if there was a, a behavioral issue, like maybe they, they, they left because they thought the queen wasn't there because they couldn't smell her or something like that. And that's definitely a possibility. As Elizabeth mentioned, bees have a lot of very complex behaviors that they do, and they think reason uh, fairly, fairly well for something with such a small brain. Um, and definitely there could be a case where, like, something is causing them to, yeah, to, to lose their sense of smell or something like that, and they just leave. Um, there's also a phenomenon when bees are, are, are very sick. 
um, they leave. And it's thought that they're just kind of like committing suicide so that they don't infect the rest of the, the colony. So they have these behaviors that could be entering into it too. But it, it, again, that, that's not that's not. Yes. Uh, what, what about the research of uh, a French uh, scientist named uh, Mikhail Henri who found that with low dosage of neonicotinoids, the uh, the worker bees would be disoriented and could not come back. Yes, uh, yes. So you were asking about there was some uh, research done in, in France where they did give uh, low, uh, more field realistic doses to honeybees and they found it affected their behavior and they had trouble finding their way back to the hive. Yes, that, that's definitely true. Um, and so it could be that that's one avenue that people are, are looking at right now is that the, the doses in the field might be affecting, as, as I talked about before, the behavior of the bees. And so it's maybe not killing them outright, but it's causing them to just sort of like they don't, maybe they don't find their way back. The issue here, though, is that with, with colony collapses, it's, it's really sudden. So if you saw kind of a dwindling of, of the bees not coming back, it's, it's more of like there's, there's the suddenness where, in this case, basically all of them are gone. Um, and on top of that, it's, it, what he found was that they were less able to get back. So for an individual bee, maybe it wouldn't get back, but on the whole, they do, the colony as a whole can get back. Um, that's one issue. The second issue is that, is again, it's not clear if this is exactly the dose that they get in the field. Well, according, according to uh, what, what I read, uh, he's, he says that he claimed that the mathematics... Yeah, I did see the formula, and I can't work the formula out, but... <laughs> it it would lead to a column collapse. Yeah, yeah, and there's there's debate on the parameters of the formula also. Like, is he using the correct parameters? There's, um, and, I, and I actually can't speak too much to that because I don't understand the formula, unfortunately. Yes? Is there any way to track the movement of bees in a hive? Yes, okay, so you asked if there's any way to track the movement of bees in the hive. And I think that was the study where they put the, the radio frequency ID uh, on the bees. Yeah, so you can actually put little tiny chips on the bees. But of course then you have to wonder, is this chip affecting um, how the, the bee flies? Um, okay. Yes? Two questions about the deadly mites that uh, attack the bees. Mm -hmm. Are there any predators that uh, you know, prey on those mites? Or, and second question is, uh, are there any pesticides that target those mites? Uh, yes, so your first question was about the mites and whether there are any predators for the mites. And um, I don't know of any in particular, but everything is, eats, is eaten by something. Like there's, I'm sure it gets something that kills it, uh, whether it's the... are hygienic. They know how to clean the Yes, yes, exactly. So you mentioned there are, there are some strains of bees that actually uh, clean off uh, these mites, and I, I was going to talk about them a, a little bit later. But, uh, and then the other question you had asked was... Uh, pesticides. Oh, pesticides, yes, yes, sorry, thank you. Um, whether there are pesticides for, for these mites. Yes, there are pesticides for these mites. Um, the problem that we have right now is that they're actually evolving resistance to the pesticides, so it would be great if we had comments. Okay, so I'm going to move on now, and if there are other questions, you can ask me later. Um, so, where are we? Okay, so what causes colony collapse disorder? I basically went through all of these individual things that we're talking about and, and, and checked them all off as being, well, this isn't the cause. Um, and so the evidence still remains very strong for an infectious agent. So, for example, um, colonies that have colony collapse disorder are likely to have colonies around them with colony collapse disorder. Um, and furthermore, if you take um, the the hive of a bee that's the bees that have died of colony collapse disorder, and you put new bees in, they can get they can actually get it again. But if you irradiate it first, they won't. So there's this idea, there's still a, a strong idea that there's an infectious component at least of this. Um, and one thing that has been seen in basically all of the studies is that colonies that have colony collapse disorder um, are just infected with more of everything. So this is a comparison here. Here is a, a colonies without colony collapses, sort of here's colonies with them. This is just measures of the levels of infection. And you see that if you have colony collapse disorder, you, for basically every case here, except for this, uh, this case from the schema here, you have much higher levels of, of infection of all these different viruses. And here's this, as I mentioned before, Israel QB process viruses in general fairly rare. 
but so we see see here we have this sort of like they have this uh, phenotype where they kind of are infected with a lot of diseases. And if we go back to that first study I mentioned where they found that Israel acute B paralysis virus, um, they also noticed that if you had four uh, or more infections going on in the, you, you were very, very likely to have colony collapse disorder. So there's this ratio here. And then in the colonies that didn't have colony collapse disorder, none of them had this high level infection. So this is even more predictive than, than if, you, if you take it as a whole than this, this uh, Israel QP paralysis virus was. So what we've come up with is this is the, the consensus cause of colony collapse disorder, which is sort of this like death by a thousand cuts. Um, so you have bees that are under a lot of stress, and the stress uh, of various types causes a weakened immunity. And so because they're weakened in immunity, they're infected with all of these different uh, pathogens, these viruses and, and, and parasites and things like that. And then it eventually leads to, um, this infection leads to death. And so there's a whole bunch of different stresses that these are under. And the first would be uh, genetic stress. So as Elizabeth mentioned, the, the colonies are all, uh, a single colony, of course, is, is sort of all related because they all come from this one queen. Um, but actually on the population level, it turns out that these are fairly uh, not genetically diverse, which makes them less able to adapt to new stresses and, and pests and, and things like uh, pests and uh, viruses. And so it turns out like the bees in the U.S., uh, almost all of them have come from about 600 queens. Um, so they, all the bees you see. And, and in the U.S., actually bees are not native. We brought them over from Europe. Um, so actually that technically makes any wild bees you see um, feral bees because there were domestic bees that escaped. Um, but it's kind of interesting feral bees running around. But um, so the, because they're sort of genetically, they've been bred to be a certain way and we have very few queens, they're sort of uh, genetically not diverse, so they have difficulty adapting. Um, the second thing is nutrition. Um, as time has gone by, they've gotten less and less of a varied food source. So when the bees go to pollinate the almonds, all they get is these almond trees. They just get whatever pollen's in there. Normally bees need to pollinate a lot of things to get the, the pollen and the food that they need. So they need to do wildflowers and other plants and things like that. And if you're only eating, say if, if, you, if you were only eating, say, bread, after a while you're not going to feel very good. You're not going to be healthy. So bees are actually having, they're under a lot of nutritional stress partly because they're doing a lot of this pollinating, where they're pollinating a single crop, but also partly because we've planted so many crops. There's a lot less wildflowers for them to forage on and for them to get you know, the, the nutrition that they need. Um, and the third thing, as I mentioned, is pesticides. And, I, and again, I want to be clear, pesticides are not good for bees. They're definitely bad for bees. Um, and they probably are contributing in some way. And so the, the idea is that they're causing small sublethal effects. So they're not killing the bees but they're doing things like maybe changing their behavior or changing their ability to fight off infections. Um, so it's definitely thought that pesticides are a strong component. It's just not the cause. And so these stresses cause weakened immunity, which uh, enables the bees to be more infected by, um, by parasites and also by viruses. And so you have this sort of uh, stew of all of these terrible things going on, and we have your, your, your genetically weak, starving, uh, poison, slightly poisoned, stressed bee uh, gets these viruses, now it's dying because it, it just can't fight them off. And so the idea here is that it's just it's this combination of all of these things. Or maybe it's the bee gets a virus and now it can't really handle the pesticide. So it's, it's just it's a multifactorial thing that's going on. Um, and so the question is, is there anything we can do about this? We have a million things. How, how are we going to address this? Well, it turns out we can probably address each of these things. Um, the first thing is the genetics of the bees, and uh, as somebody mentioned before, there are actually bees that have a trait called VSH, which is a varroa sensitive hygiene, and these bees are basically super neat freaks, and they find varroa and, when it's there and they take it off, and they're actually able to deal with varroa quite well, and they've been working on this for quite a while, um, and it's just recently uh, the, this sort of locus where this, in the, the genome where this gene is, has been found, so it's thought that we can just breed bees that will on their own, be much more resistant to varroa, which would, would, be, would be great. And the second thing is nutritional. So if farmers um, who want bees to come uh, pollinate their fields, if they could also plant things for other forage for the bees. So if wildflowers, if you could have a, a meadow nearby with lots of wildflowers and things like that, the bees can get better nutrition. 
Um, alternatively, we can maybe give them uh, supplements in, in, in their food. You can feed these food and we can give them uh, different supplements to help them be more uh, better, better, have better nutrition. Um, the third thing here, uh, pesticides. Um, so you might say, well, uh, there's maybe the pesticides aren't killing the bees outright, but there's evidence that something's going on. So why don't we just be cautious and just stop using these neonicotinoid pesticides? But that creates a lot of other problems because it turns out the pesticides that the neonicotinoids are replacing are actually much worse. So the pesticides that are replaced are very, very harmful to, to mammals and other things, which is why we use these neonicotinoids, which have a much less effect on, on us. Um, and then the second thing is that the, the pesticides that they're replacing are much more toxic for bees themselves. And what would happen is you would spray it on and you just have to say, don't bring your bees near these crops because I sprayed it with pesticide. But bees died all the time from this because maybe a farmer wouldn't tell somebody or maybe they'd accidentally spray them on a crop. So the bees actually died a lot more from other pesticides for sure. And there's a lot of beekeepers who think the neonicotinoids are actually better um, because they're just not, they don't, they clearly don't kill them outright. Um, the second thing is when you plant seeds, it kicks up a lot of dust. And if you have pesticide on the seeds, this dust comes off the seeds, it goes into the air, and if it has the, these neonicotinoids on the seeds, the dust is quite toxic and it will kill the bees. So what can be done is you can put like basically glue on the seeds so that the pesticide does not come off and kill the bees. So that's one thing that can be done. Um, it's a uh, notima you can treat with a fungicide, which will kill the fungus. Um, it's a little bit complicated though because it's, there's some work that suggests that the fungicide is also toxic to the bees, so maybe we need another fungicide. But uh, I think if we do some more research on that, we can make some progress. As mentioned before, the, the varroa is, is the biggest problem. Ideally, we would have uh, bees that are resistant genetically, maybe, um, that can you know, be, be uh, have the, the varroa sensitive hygiene clean it off, or maybe new miticides that can kill it. Um, that's still a, a big problem. It's the biggest problem. And finally, for a viral infection, there's a company that invented something called Remipi. And it works kind of like, it's kind of akin to having a vaccine. And basically, they feed it to the bees, and they were able to show that when they feed it to the bees, it actually decreases the amount of, of virus it targets, which is the Israel acute bee paralysis virus, and it's actually in FDA trials right now for treating bees. Um, and there's, if it does work, there's no reason it couldn't work for all the other viruses, which are, are quite similar. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit, it's like a little bit of a tangent, but um, what can we learn about this, about basically what we just went through? Um, and one thing I want to focus on, again, with varro this varroa destructor and some of these other things, is where do these new diseases come from? So varroa destructor was in eastern honeybees for a long time, and they basically tolerated it more or less. And what happens was uh, the western honeybees sort of emigrated and moved into Russia and Asia, and it came into contact with the East Asian honeybee, and basically it caught varroa destructor from them. Um, and the same thing happened with the, the, the Nosema, which was also a, a parasite that affected eastern honeybees and then came to the western honeybee and seemed to be um, more, more destructive. Um, and so what happens is when these new populations come in contact with each other, there's sort of a, a delicate balance of the, the host pathogen that get, gets disrupted. So for any pathogen, they actually don't want to kill the host because you live there. Um, but what happens is, is when you infect a host, the host tries to fight you off. So you need to fight back by becoming more and more virulent, more infectious, whatever. And the host ups the game. And so over the course of evolution, there's sort of this arms race going on. And so this basically happened with, with, with say, Varroa and the eastern honeybee, but when, along comes the western honeybee. The western honeybee didn't evolve these defenses. And so suddenly um, this, this pathogen is going gonna, is gonna to wipe it out, it's going to kill it, which is not the pathogen's sort of goal. They don't have gold directed behavior, but that's not what it, what it would want to do if it were, if it were uh, living there. And so basically it's just this idea of new things coming in contact um, and it jumps to a new host. It's, it's quite pathogenic. Similarly, the Israel acute bee paralysis virus, um, it seems to have come from, the, in fact, it definitely came from these other vir viruses that were, were around. And it's this acute bee paralysis virus. Uh, there's a pretty clear line that it evolved at, at some point into something called the Kashmir bee virus. And then this was off somewhere, we don't know where, and it evolved again into this, this Israel acute bee paralysis virus. And it does this 
by basically mutation. These, these viruses mutate really, really fast. These, they're called um, RNA viruses. And they, they're able to mutate very fast. And on top of that, they're actually able to trade pieces of their genome. So if you look at this one, it looks like it actually swapped in some pieces from this one. Um, and so the question is, uh, are there more of these out there? So these new sort of infections are appearing a lot. Are there any more of them out there? Um, and this is slightly tangentially related, but this is some work I did a few years ago. Um, we basically said, well, let's find out what viruses are in a lake, because nobody knows what viruses are in a lake. It'll be cool. So we went to a, a, a small lake in Maryland, and we took a little bit of water, and we sequenced it. We did like uh, that first study did. We looked at the DNA, or in this case, the RNA that was in it, and we found, we figured out what viruses were in there. And so this is just a picture of all of the viruses that we found in here. And this is a pie chart showing sort of the relative representation. And the first thing I want to say is that almost all of these are basically unknown viruses. We just, we found the nearest common relative and we named it that. But almost all of these are not actually the virus that this name. You don't have to, you can't see it, I know, but you, you don't have to see it. Um, I, I just want to say is that there's this incredible diversity. These are just these, these small RNA viruses. This is one leg. Um, in one location at, at, at two different time points. But um, one interesting thing we saw was that there's a whole bunch of distant, let me just, let's just say distant, distantly related uh, to these viruses that infect bees. So it turns out there's a lot of these different viruses out there, and they're mutating all the time, and on top of that, they're trading pieces of the genome. So maybe this isn't a virus that can infect bees, but maybe it can swap in if, it, if it's ever infecting the same thing, a piece from another virus that infects bees, and it can make, become more pathogenic. Um, and on top of that, the, the question is, is what are the viruses that are in all the other lakes, so in Asia or in, or in South America? I don't know if you've heard, but there's um, the so-called uh, killer bees, the Africanized honeybees, which are just moving up from South America into to, to the U.S., um, what viruses are they bringing with them? What's going to happen as they encounter the bees that are here? Are there going to be new viruses or new problems? Or as um, we have different trade in different areas, are there isolated areas where a virus maybe evolved with a bee over time and has never seen the bees here? And what's going to happen? Um, and so that's going to sort of segue into what Kevin's going to talk about if for some reason uh, we lost all of the bees. But I just want to end with a short summary. Um, so I covered um, defining what colony collapse disorder is, or, or CCD, which if you were raised Catholic as I was, it makes it the second most frightening uh, use of the CCD acronym. Um, uh, <laughs> also, I talked about the investigation into potential causes of CCD, and I hopefully end with, um, here's the, the headline, which maybe is not so dramatic. Um, Consensus is building for that a complex set of stressors and pathogens is associated with colony collapse disorder. And researchers are increasingly using multifactorial approaches to study causes of colony lapse, with an exclamation point, presumably. Um, so it's hard to summarize that in a headline, but this is really sort of where things stand and what we know. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Yes, way up there. Um, you said earlier that calling class disorder hasn't been found in Australia at all. So are there any counts known as a plus threat for Okay, so the question was about uh, Australia, where there is no colony collapse disorder. And it turns out, yes, Australian bees are actually super, super healthy. They also don't have um, the varroa mite. They've managed to uh, prevent it from being imported there, uh, which is kind of amazing. So they also have, the way they use their bees is a little bit different. So we have this system here where, as we mentioned before, almost all the bees go to pollinate, say, almonds in, in like January or February. So we ship our bees all over the place for pollinization, and it's sort of more industrial in, environment. It's a little bit different there. I think that doesn't happen as much. Um, and it, so there's a lot of factors that, that, that come into it. But yeah, Australian honeybees are just a lot healthier than ours, and, and probably almost certainly less stressed. Uh, yes. Are queens in general just more hardy and healthier than the rest of the colony? That's why they're not really 
probably dying off. Yeah, something. actually, so the question was whether queens are healthier and hardier than the rest of the colony. I actually don't know, but I would guess that they are. Um, if nothing else, they are a little bit bigger, too. So their, their dose is going to be a little bit smaller. Um, yes, right there. Now, is the CCD uh, the same? Is it occurring the same in feral bees and domestic bees? OK, the question was about uh, the, the, the wild or feral bees and um, domestic, the, the domestic bees. Um, so people aren't really monitoring wild bees, whether they're having colony. So the only way you see colony collapse disorder is if you come out to the hive and suddenly it's gone. Nobody is really monitoring wild hives in, so that they could just say, oh, this hive had bees, and then like a, a week later, they're all gone. So we don't really know. But what we do know is that the population of wild bees is decreasing. Um, generally, if you see a honeybee somewhere, it probably came from somebody who was raising honeybees. The, the wild population is definitely going downhill, probably for the same reasons or maybe for other reasons. Uh, OK, one more question right, right there. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is again is about the um, you know where 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 the bees are going, um, and as far as I know, it's not something that people have really done. Just because I I couldn't find it. Like I really I was really curious. I was like, well, somebody must know. I could not find anyone who found where the bees go. So. Uh, I think for the most part people don't care that much just because they're like, well, they're gone, so it doesn't matter where they went, they're, they're dead either way. So, All right, thank you, and if there's any more questions, I'll be happy to talk later. So we'll just move to a quick five-minute break, and then at 8.30, we'll be back for the third part on robo -B. Thank you. Thank you. 
talking about robo bees which are essentially robotic bees and I'll be look so we'll be looking at bees now um, not as animals and not as uh, economic necessities but as a, an inspiration for other technological innovations so I'll start by um, posing a question let's let's think the unthinkable let's imagine that all the bees actually did die um, we would be we would have no more almonds, apparently. So we want to prevent that from happening. And there's, you can imagine a variety of ways that you could try to uh, solve the problem if, if all the bees were gone. Um, but just one possible solution that we're dreaming up uh, is that we, repl we, we replace the bees with, the, not replace, but we, um, we make robotic bees to take the place of the presumably missing bees to pollinate our crops. So um, that is actually the uh, motivation for uh, what we call the Robo Bee Project, which is a project that's going on at Harvard University in the lab that I work in. Um, and it's uh, my professor, Robert Wood, um, started this project in 2009 with a grant from the National Science Foundation. Uh, and the explicit goals are to try to make a swarm of robotic bees to, to pollinate crops. Um, but, but also, it's explicitly trying to push uh, the limits of our technology, push the limits of how, how small we can make robots and how small we can make machines. Um, we'll be, we're investigating how to make very tiny sensors, um, and, and also we're uh, investigating how do we control uh, many different robots all at the same time. So these are all uh, very difficult um, engineering challenges, uh, and, and this project sort of um, pulls it all together and, and, and hopefully it all comes together and creates something like a swarm of robotic bees, but the technology is also useful for other things as well. 
So um, the question is, is uh, do we really need robotic beads? No, we, we don't actually need robotic beads. We just need very small flying robots. Um, and they don't have to be, they don't have to look like beads. Um, and, and we would use these robots uh, for pollinated crops uh, to go from flower to flower, but also to fly around uh, and, and like search and rescue operations. If there was an earthquake and, and buildings had collapsed, uh, they could be used to search for survivors. They can be used to fly out into the environment and, and sort of monitor the environment, um, chemical traces, heat. Um, so the, the thing is though that uh, the, our current technologies with like tiny airplanes or tiny helicopters, uh, they don't cut it. Uh, it's despite us all having iPhones and, and we have a space shuttle, we still don't have any robots that are very good at flying indoors and in very small, close environments. And uh, we think we may need that. Um, so the, the technologies that we are familiar with, helicopters and airplanes, um, as maybe you've experienced flying little model hel helicopters, but they're very difficult to fly around in, in very cramped quarters. Uh, but bees and a lot of other flying insects are very good at flying around anywhere. So um, as we're you know, trying to make our helicopters better, we also thought, well, what if we try to uh, copy what the bees are doing, try to, try to make robots that have two flapping wings? Maybe that can, can allow us to, to maneuver around close quarters better. So, so um, that's really what we're going for. And we just have an intuition that bees might be better for tight quarters. So let's say we're going to build a robotic bee. Um, how do we do it? Uh, there, these are, robotic bees are very, very small. And uh, there are no off-the-shelf components. There's no solution that we can just buy and put together. So we are actually starting from scratch on, on everything that is in a robot, everything from the wings to the body to the sensors to the, the brain, the brain chip, um, the battery, uh, everything we're making from scratch. Uh, and, and in designing a robot, a robotic bee, the, the questions that we ask ourselves, the big questions are, how do, how do we make a robot generate lift and control um, with only two flapping wings? How do we make a robot, this robot, able to sense the world? And uh, how do we make these robots perform tasks intelligently? How do we give it artificial intelligence? Um, so I'm a mechanical engineer, and I will be talking in depth about, more in depth about the generation of lift and control. Uh, and I'll just touch very briefly on the other two questions, which I'm not an expert on. So um, first question that we ask is, as the mechanical designers of the robot is, how do bees and flies fly? So uh, let me just give you a slight note. Um, our robot is called a robotic bee because uh, we're interested in also creating like uh, colony uh, behaviors or swarms or coordinated behaviors. Uh, but the robot, as uh, you may have remember from the picture, uh, also kind of looks like a fly. Um, and so from an engineering standpoint, bees and flies are very, very similar. Uh, bees actually have four wings. But they, um, for most of their flight behaviors, they, they actually flap their, their wings like almost two wings. The, the four wings just become two, and they sort of hook two, two pairs of wings together. Uh, and flies actually have two wings. So uh, we are essentially modeling our robot as bees or flies. So how do bees and flies fly? Um, their wings actually move in a very complicated three-dimensional trajectory. And um, there's a lot of aero aerodynamics and, and mechanics that are going on that are very difficult to understand, and, and, and scientists are still working on understanding them. Um, but for us engineers, we decided to simplify the motion of the, the wings to something that maybe we can actually build. So um, we distilled the motion of flapping wing uh, insects down to two motions. Um, the first one is, is the main uh, flapping wing motion which just flaps the wing back and forth. And then the second motion that is important is that the, the wing also rotates about, the, the, about the, this axis. So um, the, the flight, the lift forces are actually generated when these two motions, these two like main motions, are coordinated in a certain way. And, and this, on average, produces a, a, a downward lift force that push, then would presumably push um, the robot up. So this was a simplification that we made 
to, to deal with this very complicated three-dimensional trajectory that, that um, bees and flies are actually able to do. So with that in mind, um, we, are, we as engineers are going to try to reproduce this motion. And um, these are sort of the, the design challenges uh, for the engineering, for us the mechanical engineers. Uh, it has to be designed for flight, so the robot has to be lightweight enough to lift itself off the ground. Um, we have to design it so that it can actually control itself. It has to be able to stabilize itself in the air. And uh, we have to design it so that we can actually make it. How do we make tiny, tiny machines like this? So uh, before I go into um, you know, how we dealt with these questions, do you guys have any questions for me? Yes? Uh, it seems like you're, you're trying to take a complicated problem and you're trying to simulate it at a small scale. Would it make sense to, sim to do it at a bigger scale and then shrink it down? Or is there something wrong with that? Or is it small here? Right, so the question is, why don't we make like a big robot and then shrink it down? And uh, so we, we scientists have made larger scale versions of the uh, bee flapping wings to try to understand it. Um, and uh, that has worked to some degree. But um, one of the challenges is that uh, whatever you make at the large scale, uh, once you shrink it down, um, you have to change the way you build the thing completely. Like, you can't just take a large screw and then shrink it down to a small screw and expect, expect that screw to still work the same way. So um, as you'll see later, uh, the manufacturing challenge is actually what prevents us from simply taking anything big and making it small. Like, once you get it small, you're changing the way you're building it, and then everything that you designed into it changes because the, the way you build it is different. Uh, yeah. Okay. How long can I have two questions? How long can a robot be stay on with its own battery? And also, the robot discuss individual artificial intelligence. Does the robot have artificial intelligence? Yeah, the robots. Okay, so the robot bees don't have artificial intelligence yet. As as you'll see in the the latter half of my presentation, uh, we are still very very early on in this project, and we haven't even gotten to the artificial intelligence problem yet, or the battery problem. So. <laughs> We still these robots, as you'll see later, they don't have robots uh, batteries on them yet. Okay, so I'll, I'll just move on then to the uh, how we addressed um, those three questions that I had posed. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the design for control problem. So there were many iterations to the robot, and I don't have time to go through all the iterations that that the team has gone through over the last almost six years of working on this. I'll just go over the most recent design. And uh, the most recent design of the robot, so on the, on the left here, um, you see the robot. It's got two wings, a uh, body that's like a stick. Um, and when we zoom in, we see that uh, there are two flight muscles in the robot. And these flight muscles um, are made of piezoelectric ceramic, which is a type of material that when you apply electricity to it, um, this, this beam of material will bend. And so by alternatingly applying an electrical voltage to this beam, you get this beam to bend back and forth. And then that bending motion is what we then use to uh, flap the wings. And, because, and there are two flight muscles, and each flight muscle is flapping one wing. So each wing on the robot, these two wings, are, are flapped uh, completely independently. And uh, if you can imagine having like sort of two thrusters on, on either side of you, that's sort of what the robot has. Um, each wing is, is you know, generating its own lift thrust, lift vector. Um, sorry. So uh, with these two um, wings, we're hopefully able to, once it gets up into the air, it's able to control itself. And as it turns out, we are actually able to do that with just two wings, flat and like so. Um, so to generate the uh, necessary uh, body motions to keep the robot stable in the air, we um, have to flap the wings in, in a particular way. Um, so there are three axes of rotation that are important for objects that are flying. Um, they are the roll axis, the pitch axis, and the yaw axis. So the uh, roll axis is basically, so if this is the robot and it's facing you, roll axis is, is this 
rotation axis. And to do that, we simply flap one wing with a larger stroke angle than the other wing, and that should create a larger lift force on one side, and that will tilt the robot about the roll axis. To um, tilt about the pitch axis, we flap the wings such that the wing is sort of a little bit further in front of the robot or a little bit further uh, behind the robot, and that will cause the robot to pitch back and forth. And then to yaw, or to spin the robot about its, you know, about spin the robot like this, um, we flap the wing by flapping forward faster than we flap backwards. So when we flap forward, the, the wing uh, encounters more air drag, and that causes, uh, a, well, it, it essentially it's like paddling in the air. You, you move forward faster and you move backwards slower, and you're paddling around in the air. And that's what causes the robot to spin. So with these three um, torques, uh, these three you know, rotations under control, uh, you'll see that we're actually able to get this robot to, to be stable when it's flying. And, uh, and I, also I also mentioned that there was a rotation to the wing. So um, the, the rotation of the wing is actually done completely um, passively. Uh, we don't actually control the rotation of the wing. What actually happens is uh, we just create a hinge at the base of the wing, at the shoulder, and that hinge allows the wing to um, allows the wing to be sort of just to, to rotate back and forth like this. And so when the wing moves forward, the air hits and in, runs into the wing, and it causes the wing to tilt to rotate. And then once it goes backwards, the air again rotates the wing the other way. So that's how we're able to get that um, wing rotation like so. So we're only really controlling the flapping motion, and we're letting that rotation motion happen naturally. And that was just another simplification that we made because it's so hard to build these robots. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the question of designing for manufacturing. Um, so it's very, very difficult to build tiny machines like this. You can imagine maybe we can make robots the same way we make Swiss watches with gears and, and, and little you know, screws and holes and, and individual linkages. But um, it turns out that it's very difficult to, to make holes and little screws um, precisely and repeatably at such a small scale, uh, and also do it with very, very lightweight materials. So we cannot make this robot the same way we would make a Swiss watch. Uh, we, have to, we had to reinvent the way we make these things. So we, we created a process that essentially uses carbon fiber, which is... Um, me, which is something that I wrote on this piece of paper. A rigid material used to construct most of the body, and it's a, a composite material that consists of many tiny, high-strength, uh, low-weight fibers of carbon material woven together and glued with resin. So that's um, the rigid but very lightweight material that consists of most of the RoboB. And then we also use um, thin plastic film, which is flexible. So we basically uh, glue and sandwich the plastic film between um, two layers of very thin carbon fiber, and then we use a laser and we sort of expose the plastic through the carbon fiber like in slits. And uh, wherever a slit of uh, plastic is exposed through the carbon fiber, it forms a folding hinge. And so we actually use these fold joints um, which are created completely in two dimensions. So we, everything is, is made flat and uh, we'll create these hinge joints, and then we will fold everything up into 3D. So um, there's just a, a sequence of images here um, highlighting the, the series of, of you know, steps. And, and so with every fold joint, we're able to um, create uh, a 2D flat structure and then fold it up into more complicated three-dimensional structures. And this, and this like, idea of folding was really the, the only way that we can get the precision and the repeatability that is required out of um, machines uh, this small. So uh, this is just a close-up of uh, the transmission that sort of turns the, the bending of the flight muscle uh, into the flapping motion of the wing. And uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, to tell what's going on, but the point is that there are uh, you know, alternating uh, parts, points where there's like a, a link, a rigid carbon fiber link, and then right next to that is a flexible plastic hinge. So this is just a series of, of rigid carbon fiber and then plastic hinge exposed, and then we create a series of folding joints that then create a more complicated um, mechanism. So uh, in, in addition to 
um, the manufacturing, we also had to choose very lightweight materials. We had to design the robot so that it's very small and, and um, is as well as simple as possible, just so that we can get this thing to be very lightweight and hopefully uh, lift itself off the ground. And uh, as, as it turns out, after years of research, uh, we were able to create repeatable results. We were able to make a robot um, of this design again and again and, and actually be able to make it repeatably, precisely, accurately. Um, and um, so this is just a huge step toward our final goal of, of robotic P. Um, and so here are the stats. Uh, the robot weighs 80 milligrams, which is a little bit more lightweight than actual bees, which are like 100 milligrams. But then again, this does not include many, many other components that are needed for the final product. Um, the robot has a wingspan of three centimeters, and it flaps its wings uh, at 120 times a second, which is uh, very fast, but it's actually slower than what bees will flap, which are uh, the bees flap upwards of 175 times a second. Um, so this is just what we were able to get to. And uh, this video that I'm about to show um, shows our most uh, recent results. So this, so we've been able, we're actually able to control this robot. We're actually able to keep it up in the air. And um, what I'll, you'll end, what you end up seeing is that this uh, robot actually has to fly in a very controlled laboratory environment because uh, there's, first of all, no battery, so the robot still has a thin copper wire that's powering it, and the robot also has no brain, no eyes, no sense of itself, and so we actually have to watch the robot with cameras, um, and so the cameras will watch the robot and, and keep track of how its body is turning in, in these cameras right here. And uh, we then take that camera information and we figure out how to flap its wings to keep itself in the air. And then we feed that information back into it with that wire. Um, but you see that, that we're actually able to, to keep this thing up in the air. So this highlights um, two very important uh, steps. Uh, one is that we uh, can build robots like this, these very tiny robots. And the other is that we understand somewhat. <laughs> Um, how the wings generate lift, and we understand somewhat how we can get this robot to fly, how, how, and how maybe perhaps how bees fly. Um, those are two two major questions that we we think we've sort of accomplished uh, over the last few years, and we're able to get the robot to do very simple side to side flights. So, have we have we succeeded? Did we win? Um, probably not. Uh, there's a huge list of things that we still have to research on. Um, we have to really understand the flight mechanics more in order to to, to generate more like acrobat acrobatic motions in the air, just like you know real flies and bees. Uh, we still need to deal with uh, sensors and power. We still have to add a battery to it. There's no battery out there, battery technology out there that we can just take off. We can just buy from some company that is small enough and has enough energy inside to power this robot. Uh, we need uh, sensors on the robot, um, and uh, we also need to give it a brain. So we have people who are working on um, the world's smallest and most uh, low-power uh, CPUs to put on this robot. Uh, and then after that, we have to get these robots to work together, like a real bee colony. And so that requires um, some algor algorithms from like the computer scientists' research. Um, and not to mention, we have to figure out how to pick up and put down pollen. Uh, we are also not worried about the legs. We're not worried about the stinger. We're not worried about creating ro uh, tiny robo bee babies. <laughs> we don't need to worry about queens. Um, there's just so many other things that we're, we're just like not even thinking about because we're just so set on the the first few problems. So uh, you, you you'll see that like this project requires biologists and mechanical engineers and electrical engineers and computer scientists to work together, um, and so it's a very very interdisciplinary project. Um, and this and that's what it takes to to sort of create um, you know pie in the sky uh, technology innovations. So uh, in summary for the evening. Um, 
So uh, Elizabeth talked about beekeeping and the bees as organisms and animals. And uh, Ryan talked about uh, threats to bees because bees are, are you know, important, uh, an important uh, factor in, in our agricultural, uh, I guess, in our economy. And, uh, and I just talked about bees as an inspiration for, um, for tiny flying robots. Uh, so in summary, uh, I uh, have worked on this project personally for the last three years. And um, as I look back, uh, at our inspiration, the bee, I can't help but be uh, humbled and amazed by how it's able to just fly and then also fit on all of the, the components that are needed to, to fly and to, to do useful things in the world. And um, so bees are amazing creatures. Um, I think we may be deceived by how, how um, I guess how they're everywhere and, and how easy it seems, but that ease is, is masking this complexity, this complexity of, of the, the flight mechanics and also the, the neuromotor sensory systems that are, in, that are uh, happening in it. And so uh, I hope that our lectures tonight uh, as a series give you a lens, a new lens through which to view uh, bees as miraculous animals and also machines. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I hope be for Before I forget, I'd like to thank um, Elizabeth and Ryan uh, for, for also joining me in this really fun uh, uh, event, and also to uh, Laura Klein, who is our uh, lecture coordinator and uh, helps us to arrange everything that you saw today. So thank you, and uh, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. Um, have you considered using, uh, I know this is your ultimate goal, but uh, a transmissible power source? Yeah, we, we've, we, we're working on solar cells, we're working on wireless power, and batteries. Wireless power would seem a natural application for this, at least as a step. Yeah, so we are working on wireless power. Um, there's a lot of problems associated with it. Um, but it's something that is underway as well. We're trying a lot of different options because we don't know what really is going to work. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you always hear like this, like, or, like those things like um, bees' bodies are too big for their wings to like, fly. Is there any truth to that at all, or is that just basically uh, there? So the question is, uh, people have said that bees can't fly because their wings are too small for their big bodies. Uh, but um, some people did some digging on that that myth, and uh, it's it's not true. It's just somebody said that who did not understand the flight mechanics of the bees at all and just made that up in the 1960s. Uh, yeah. Um, as another like intermediate step towards the final uh, goal, um, is there any discussion of possibly foregoing individual intelligence at all and just having kind of third party, like more traditional flying robot around to direct them all uh, individually instead of allowing them to you don't have to program them individually. Right. Only. So, uh, the question was, uh, can we not give them brains and just control them remotely and, and have something else control them? Um, that is a possible solution, um, but we haven't even begun to work with like wire, wireless radios at this scale. So that's something that we could do, but it's just so early on that we, we can't even say like that's something that we should or shouldn't do. Just one more question. Just one more question. Okay, um, sure. I would like to send you this one. Well, if it, like, if it gets in, is it going to work or you will be able to fix it after or if it's working well? Um, the, the question is uh, do, are these robots, uh, I guess, repairable or do they just break and we can never fix them again? Um, they, they are repairable to some extent. Yeah, we, we can fix them if the wing falls off. So we can still do that. And that happens a lot. <laughs> okay, so thank you. And I guess I guess we'll be up here if you, if anybody else has questions. And also, um, we have a beekeeper here. Yeah, beekeeper who's here also take your questions. Um, that was not down. So thank you, guys. Yeah. Here's what's great.